Good morning. I'm excited to be here. I think I'm somewhere in Atlantic time zone still. Uh, it's actually uh, very special for me to be invited here. I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got here. Um, 20 years ago, I started at Microsoft. Uh, then security to me was things like access control, cryptography, Kerberos. That was what it was about. Then we had this thing called uh, Blaster, Slammer, Code Red, Nemda, you may remember. Um, then we learned security was about vulnerabilities, about threat modeling, about secure coding practices. And then every now and then a company makes a very important hire. And for Microsoft at that time, one of those people was Windows Snyder. And Window introduced Microsoft, introduced me to the security community. She brought me along to PH Neutral. How many of you have heard of PH Neutral? Uh, I met FX for the first time. I met these two crazy guys from a group called Toolcrypt who told me about Pass the Hash, uh, UC and Jurgen. I met Tomi. He told me about this thing called T2, that I should go there to it, uh, and many others. Um, and what they taught me was that security was really about people, and it was about community. Uh, and this community was about teaching people the right mindset, about always learning uh, and always contributing back. And so when Tommy reached out to me and said, hey, I don't know if you still remember me, but we met a long time ago, I totally remembered that conversation that we had in Berlin. I remembered hearing about T2, and I remembered uh, all of those different things. And I thought, um, one special thing about T2, I work at when I, at Microsoft, I work with engineers a lot. And one thing you learn when you work with engineers on security is engineers hate being told what to do. And security people love to tell people what to do at Microsoft. And, <laughs> and engineers hate being told what to do. So the secret to working with engineers, I found, is don't tell them what to do. I mean, you will. But don't, don't just tell them what to do. Tell them what the problem is as fully and completely as you can. And then they will understand what it is you're trying to defend and what that means. And then they will apply all of their ideas uh, and all of the kinds of things in their job that security people don't even know about to think about how to better defend systems. And part of that uh, ethic about being able to tell people what's going on is a commitment to technical excellence. And T2 has always had that commitment to technical excellence, where you need to really, truly understand what the weaknesses are, what the vulnerabilities are for a system. And that's why I think conferences like this are very important today. You know, conferences, they may start like this, but they don't always end up like this. And T2 has always honored that tradition. So I think that's just very important here. Um, and so, um, so with that, um, I wanted to come here and tell you a little bit about uh, information security. And I don't know if it's been 20 years at Microsoft, but it's, you get to a time in your career when you think about, uh, you think about what you're doing, you think, how can, we, how can I leave this field better off than when I joined it? And not that I'm leaving this field anytime soon, but you start thinking about uh, when you're exposed to this community, how do you make contributions to it? And one thing that I've learned is creating an environment where others can contribute, uh, build upon the success of others, add to something to make InfoSec more approachable. Uh, that's something that I care a lot about. So today I'm going to tell you about something I call the GitHubification of InfoSec. And if you go, I've never heard that word before, that's because I completely made it up. Uh, but you will hear about it here. So one stubborn thing about InfoSec is it very much is an experience-driven profession. You have to do it. You live and you learn through incident response. It's those hard lessons. It, it is a school of hard knocks. And it's a kind of thing that, you know, you can learn the books, but you actually have to do it. And there's so many people that, need, that have things to defend today. And I think, how can we speed the journey of these defenders? Um, I've had the fortunate experience to work with uh, defenders across lots of different organizations. And one of the most important things uh, is, is just having the right mindset about what you're defending. So many things go right or wrong, depending if you have the right mindset. And so I've encountered things over time like, you know, oftentimes people new to security know they need to protect stuff. They need to protect things in a network and they identify what the most important things in that network are to protect. 
uh, the database servers, the domain controllers, and they start with these lists of lists of things to protect. And they quickly realize, or attackers realize, they have really a graph in their network, a graph of dependencies and control relationships. And hackers understand this very well, that those servers that are important have workstations they're admin from, which have admins, and those admins uh, log on to other systems. Those systems have yet other admins, and you end up with this graph. And attackers understand that deeply, penetrate the graph somewhere, and then navigate by pivoting around. Um, and if you do incidents enough, uh, you go from this mindset of you don't just have incidents that you're responding to, you have adversaries. And your organization has relationships with these adversaries where they have a durable interest in what it is your organization does. And if you go from that mindset of incident to adversary, what you find is you start realizing there's other people that face these adversaries as well. You can get to know them, learn about their experiences, and it requires you to build relationships of trust where instead of keeping everything that happens to your organization secret for fear that it will get out, you find trusted people in industry you can talk to, talk to about similar incidents with similar adversaries, and then you can learn when the adversary is not attacking you, when they're attacking other people, and so on. So these are the kind of mindset um, things that I find that people that go through the school of hard knocks and security adopt over time, things that I've learned uh, over time myself. And so I'm always trying to think about how can we speed defenders along this journey of security and get them practicing more effectively sooner. And so, so this presentation is really all about how we increase the rate of learning in InfoSec. And there's this uh, African proverb, which I quite liked for this talk, which is, if you want to go fast, go alone. And sometimes it is important to go fast, but if you want to go far, go together. And I think this, you'll see here through this, how people working together can really achieve quite a bit. Um, so there's four different things I'm going to talk about today. One is organizing knowledge, and then making knowledge executable, so not just not just things up here, but how do you translate that to a place where you can actually practice it? And then once you have things that are executable, a big part of information security is analysis, looking at data, trying to discover what is going on. Uh, oftentimes, finding attacks is, uh, is, seems like an impossible task. When you find one, it's very difficult to understand what happened. And how do you make analysis easier? And then how do you make it easier, crucially, for others to repeat what you've done? A lot of analysis is I stand a lot of time at the keyboard, I do a bunch of stuff, and then this is what I got. And how does, how does somebody else repeat what you did? I'll show you some things that are out there to help that. And then, of course, community. So I'll start with organize, or, organizing knowledge. Um, so this is the MITRE ATT&CK framework. How many, how many people have seen the MITRE ATT&CK framework? It's, it's one of, I think, the most important contributions to InfoSec. Uh, over the last 15 years, probably as important as the concept of the kill chain was. It certainly has spread like wildfire among uh, IT, IT security practitioners. Security companies have embraced it. You know, they mark up every detection that is in their product with how it uh, maps to the MITRE ATT&CK matrix. Uh, these elements in the matrix, this is an example. This is one of my favorite kinds of uh, attack techniques that's in there. Uh, this is... Uh, called abusing accessibility features. There's, a there's this attack in Windows called the sticky keys attack. Uh, I'm seeing some nodding heads. If you don't know what the sticky keys attack is, it's a way to put a back door onto a Windows system that doesn't require any code. That if you have admin access to a system, but you know you might lose it and you want to backdoor it, you set a single registry key. And then without putting any additional binaries or whatnot on the system, if you lose access, you can always get admin access again. And the way that that works is, if you've ever been in Windows and you hit the shift key accidentally five times, you get this sticky keys dialog that pops up, and it's an accessibility uh, feature of Windows. Well, if you do the sticky keys attack, instead of getting the accessibility dialog, you get a command prompt as local system on the Windows logon desktop, which is pretty handy. Um, so it has the matrix has uh, techniques like this in there. Um, they are contributed, you can see here, from people all over, and they add to this body of techniques. And so if you're a new defender and you want to learn what are the latest things, what are the things I need to learn about, this is really a great encapsulation of them. The folks at MITRE put a lot of effort to making sure that uh, there's documentation. These things aren't just theoretical. They are validated, vetted as being real in the wild. 
And this is their, a tool they produce called the Attack Navigator. And it has these features like you can go select a threat group that is of interest to your organization. And when you select it, it tells you the set of techniques that that threat actor is known to use. And as a defender, this can be very helpful to prioritize. I mean, there's a lot of things on here and it's impossible to be fully effective on all of them. But the reality is organizations face specific threats. And if you can pick the threat groups that are of relevance to an organization, you can really start to see the sort of the intersection of where you need to focus, make sure your detective controls can see those things, find out the gaps and strengths and weaknesses and so forth. And so, you know, the, the thing, elements in this, uh, these threat groups were defined by MITRE, but how great would it be for all of the... Th groups in industry producing threat intelligence, that they would contribute their own MITRE attack definitions for the threat groups they track, whether you're FireEye or CrowdStrike or Microsoft or others. At Microsoft, we track threat groups as well. Uh, if CrowdStrike calls it Fancy Bear and FireEye calls it APT28, we call it Strontium. We assign elements from the periodic table uh, as we track these threat actor groups. And if, while it was, it's going to be while every, everybody wants the threat intel shops to come together and just have one name, please, for a threat group, the reality is probably not ever going to happen, even though they have their set of AKAs uh, for them. It's because, you know, every group tracks them slightly differently. Some have a malware-based approach, some use other techniques and so forth. But how it would still be very useful for defenders to be able to take... Um, the threat groups as they're tracked and then map them back to the, the MITRE matrix so they know what kind of TTPs those actors are, are known to utilize. And so I think this kind of thing is an important thing that all people in industry can do. So, so if this MITRE matrix, if you're familiar with it, is very on-prem network focused, it's very much you get into a Windows or Linux network, you hack around, lateral movement, persistence, et cetera. What about cloud? How well does this work for cloud? And do we need something completely different or can we build upon this? I think it'd be very important to, one, extend knowledge of this to cloud environments because so many organizations are using SaaS or infrastructure as a service. And if we can build upon what has been done here, we can contribute to a, a knowledge system that people already know and understand. If you look at attacks in cloud, I'll tell you a little bit about what I've seen at Microsoft. So one of our services is Office 365. Over the last two years, the number of techniques that are being published every month by security researchers, uh, at threat groups, has just grown very significantly as people have moved to the cloud. Every month there's a new talk, a new tool that's published, uh, a new attack found in the wild. And we certainly do see attacks in the wild against Office customers. This is uh, some tweets by a, somebody that works at Mandiant saying that um, a threat group called APT29, uh, we call them Yttrium, using PowerShell APIs to, to talk through exchange, exchange web services, to access mailboxes, to get email content. Um, our own incident response team at Microsoft, again, documenting similar attacks against customers that have moved to the cloud. And I'll show you ex examples of some of the kinds of attacks that we've seen. This is a threat group, Thallium. Um, they are linked to North Korea. And the United Nations had moved to Office 365. And this threat group, Thallium, was interested in what a committee at the UN was working on, which is a report on how North Korea was evading sanctions, how they were smuggling. And this North Korean hacker unit wanted to know what was going to be in that report. And so they targeted uh, the mailboxes of the people that were working on it and went after them, and they were on Office 365. So we identified this attack and uh, notified um, them about it. Um, another attack that we've seen Thallium do is they were spear phishing using a PDF that had this sort of gobbledygook language in it. It's not meant for you to be able to read it. And the lure is to read it, you need to install their malware. But their malware, interestingly enough, was not Win32 binaries or anything like that. It was they sent you to the Google Play Store to install an add-in for Chrome. And that add-in for Chrome was their malware. 
Um, and what it did is once it's in the browser, it can monitor every login that you did and any login that you did to google.com, any of the major mail providers, they would siphon off your credentials and then exfiltrate it. Um, and of course, to make it even more convincing, they put fake reviews onto their malicious app, five stars, uh, five stars. Um, another technique that we see very, uh, very often against cloud customers is a technique called password spray. So password spray is just sort of intelligent guessing of passwords and uh, things like two-factor auth defeat this, but many customers, you know, the adoption rates of multi-factor authentication are very low, even for enterprise customers. Um, and this toolkit has ways to do it against dis different endpoints. Uh, they have custom name lists and likely passwords for different languages. And there's kind of an inside joke among pen testers and red teams everywhere, which is if you want to know the secret to getting into any organization anywhere, I'll tell you it's one word. This is the only word you need to know. And it's fall 2019. And the idea behind... Anybody need to change their password? So the idea behind... Is of course, you have, if you have to change your password every 90 days, which many enterprise password policies do, people are going to forget, so they pick these patterns, summer 2019, you know, winter 2020, et cetera. And so you'll always find somebody in a large enough organization that has one of these kinds of passwords. And you know, through all of the different breaches over the years, they have excellent prioritized lists of passwords to try, and that's the idea behind password spray. And we see this in high volumes every single day against tenants. And and not just you know one IP trying zillions of different accounts, but sp you know sprinkling them over, trying a couple of accounts with a couple of passwords across lots of different tenants all day every day. Um, another toolkit is called Mail Sniper. This is using the legitimate APIs used to administer uh, your Exchange tenant inside of Office 365, and these tools are there to help pen testers and APT groups gain access to that and automate uh, from within there. And then as even with adoption of two-factor authentication, attackers ha are working on different techniques to get past two-factor authentication. And one of the kinds of things that we've seen against Office, and this is, uh, I think it's been seen against other sites, including Google and whatnot. And the idea is here is using OAuth-based phishing. How many of you have heard or about OAuth-based phishing. It's particularly clever in that normally for phishing, they send you an email, you click the link, and you type in your credentials into a fake site. That doesn't happen here. They send you a link, and what they've done is they've registered an application, and that application, they say, requires permissions. The permissions it requires are access to your mailbox and offline access to your mailbox, which allows them to download your email. They send a link in the email they're trying to lure you with. The link looks like this, so it goes to Microsoft's site, not a bad guy site, not a lookalike site, Microsoft's site. The user gets prompted with this consent, this OAuth consent dialogue, and if you trick the user to consent to it, um, then they get programmatic access to your mailbox. They don't need your password. As a matter of fact, it doesn't matter if you're using two-factor. It doesn't matter if you reset your password after this. You've granted them through this application programmatic access to your mailbox. So um, a way that attackers are evolving uh, against the cloud. And then Evil Jinx is another tool that they're using to bypass two-factor. The idea, this is a traditional man-in-the-middle tool, but you, you convince the user to visit a link that's not the real site. You might get a cheap SSL cert through Let's Encrypt or whatnot for it. And what the bad guy is doing is, is basically routing all your traffic in the back end to really go to Office 365 in Azure AD. You do the login. Uh, maybe you, you get a code on your phone that you or an authenticator request, and you approve that. At the reality, at the end of the authentication, what happens is this, the authentication service gives you back a cookie in your browser that proves you authenticated properly. And that's the cookie that they're trying to intercept. So then once they have that, they can impersonate you on another device anywhere. Um, and then this is another technique that we've seen. Um, you know, if you're hacked into an on-prem network, you can get at somebody's email on their PC, exfiltrate it. Um, if 
if you want to get access to somebody's email that's in the cloud and not just their current mailbox, but get access to any future mail that they get, one of the most common techniques is to install a forwarding rule into that mailbox. And you, some of them are as blatant as mail sent from anybody, forward it along to this other email account, which is their drop account where they receive all these emails, or they can be more selective with keywords from these senders with a subject line that contains, you know, payment or invoice or those kinds of things. So these uh, forwarding rules are stored inside the cloud service and people need tools in order to discover and understand these things. And so, um, and we see these used in attacks. And so if you wanted to know what a kill chain looked like for cloud, uh, for Office 365 for SAS apps. This uh, is one that I put together that maps all of these different techniques against uh, the kill chain. And all of these links here are links to public, publicly available tools and techniques. And this is the kind of knowledge that I think is important for defenders to start to have if they are going to be able to defend SAS apps and cloud against these kinds of attacks. Um, and you know, I kind of thought, how useful would it be to take things like this, develop this further, document it, go back to the MITRE attack matrix I showed you there, add and extend that matrix for attacks against cloud. Um, and so, of course, me, I tweeted about it, asked people if they'd be interested in it, um, and then Swift on Security retweeted it, and then there was just... a a ton of different interest, everybody, a lot of different interest in doing this. Um, and one of the techniques uh, I'd learned about motivating people is um, I thought, you know, I really think we need to have the office team at Microsoft on board in order to help identify, document these things. And so I secretly tagged the corporate vice president and Office 365 responsible for security there. And so every notification that came in by every like and every retweet, his phone and every meeting was like... <laughs> so it's my new technique for any time I think something that's, hey, this is a good idea, just tag the right owner in it and just see, see what happens. So, so give it a try. Um, and then... Um, one nice thing about the community is they started saying, hey, your matrix is nice, but you missed this technique. You missed that technique. A buddy of mine developed. So then people were doing my job for me. This was great. So I just like, great, documented, added it to the matrix and so on. So it made it helpful and easy to discover the different attacks that, that people had done. So that's a little bit about organizing knowledge and trying to make it simpler for people entering the field to have places to go where knowledge about attacks is consolidated, well represented in ways that vendors and security practitioners know how to go find it, discover it, contribute to it, and add to it. Um, so knowledge is great, but it would be great if knowledge was actually more executable. There's a lot of homework left to the reader to go from something you read to something you can actually do. Um, I'll start with this as an example. This was an advisory put out by US CERT about some Russian cyber activity. Um, it was actually a pretty useful advisory. They had a lot of specific detail. This is a batch file used by the threat group. You see there's a lot of commands here, registry commands, net commands, and, and there's a lot of things in here for forensics and log analysts to go look for in their environment. You can go to your seam, you can plug these rules in and look for it. These were examples of queries that you could write if you used one of our security products to go look at things in the registry. You can see this is, you look for log on events here, process creation, and so forth. So the thing about this is, while it has a lot of great detail for defenders, all of this work has to be repeated for every organization. They have to go take this advisory, translate it into whatever it is that they use, whether it's ArcSight or Elasticsearch or Splunk or you name it. Um, everybody's having to start with this and, and instead of something specific there. So there's this project that's trying to make this process easier. It's called Sigma. How many of you have heard of Sigma? So great. Um, so Sigma is an open source project. It's all available on GitHub. Florian and a colleague of his, Thomas, have re it's really a personal passion of theirs. And the idea behind Sigma is uh, being able to write rules in a generic way to detect uh, in uh, things that happen in events, in telemetry and logs, 
and then have that translated so that it works in the kinds of systems uh, that people use. So there is um, a repository of these rules on GitHub for lots of different kinds of sources of data, uh, network, uh, different operating systems, uh, different kinds of rules for malware and other types of things to look for. These are rules based on the Sysmon tool published by Mark Rosinovich and Sysinternals. Has a lot of great event level detail for the kind of things that defenders need to look at. And this is what writing at a detection looks like in the Sigma language. Um, you can see it's pretty straightforward. Look for these command lines where the parent process is when log on. This is an example looking for that sticky keys attack I mentioned earlier. Um, look for these registry keys being set and so on. You can see here it's mapped to the MITRE attack matrix, attack T technique 1015. So this is a generic language that would be useless unless it actually sped people up when they went to apply it to theirs. So Sigma has a set of open source backend translators that know how to translate that generic YAML representation to, to Splunk, to QRadar, ArcSight, Elasticsearch, Kibana, you name it. And so this, so now you can go from a generic description of an event to a way where you can actually run this tool uh, against it. And this is, there's a website where you can go select any of the different rules that are in there. They have hundreds to start with, and then you click what you want to translate it into, and then uh, through those backend providers, it translates it into the specific query language that those tools use. So now if you go back to that US CERT advisory, how useful would it have been if they would have not only published the advisory, but a set of Sigma rules along with it? And now defenders can actually start with something they can immediately plug in and apply. You know, th so I think these kind of things about taking knowledge and just making that executable so you can run it and directly apply it in a vendor neutral way, in an open source way, I think could help give defense. Think of the time that that would save. Think of the expertise that could be contributed here. So that's uh, a bit about executable know how. So like I mentioned earlier, a lot of work in InfoSec um, is about analysis, which is looking at logs and trying to work out what happened, doing pivoting, doing refinement, doing filtering. And um, I have this, this joke at Microsoft, which is, uh, you know, do you know what the number one cybersecurity tool is? I mean, there's a lot of cybersecurity startups, of course, but the number one tool, you go to every SOC, you will find this tool in it. Anybody want to guess what the number one tool is? Excel, Excel, yes. So I went to the my, I went to the Excel team and I was like, "Look, cyber is hot." Okay, so what we should do is we should take Excel, we should spin it off, we should call it Cyber Excel. We will make a billion dollars. <laughs> they said, "John, that is stupid. Excel makes two billion dollars." <laughs> so, so yes. So a lot of a lot of the wizardry and defense is time spent in Excel or things like it. And it just doesn't make it very easy for other people to repeat how you got to that end result. Why did you filter down to those things? And so people that are doing analysis, there's this journey uh, that's there where you start by looking for stuff where you're looking for an instance of something. Like look for a PowerShell command with this funny command line with this base64 encoded thing or win log on with this child process. And it's like you know the instance of what you're looking for. And there, you know, if I translate that to sort of database, you're doing a select with a where clause. You know, you're searching for column, you know, rows where you have some sort of filter you're going to apply. Maybe you do some basic joins to enrich it, but this is sort of the level where the practitioner is at. And then you go from knowing instances that you want to look for to now I want to find patterns. I want to understand what is the outlier? Like, let me look at all of the accounts that log on to my domain controllers. And I just want to know, when is an account logging on that doesn't normally do that? You don't have the specific instance. You just know you want to find the patterns. And that's about things like finding outliers, using statistical models. You start computing baselines. And it's the next level of progression of analysis that people do. And then 
maybe the next level is they don't know the pattern, but they want to use data science, machine learning to discover the pattern. They may know examples of what they're looking for. They may know the instances, but they don't know how to generalize to the pattern. But you can use you know, supervised machine learning approaches, data science, for the algorithms to identify what the underlying phenomenon are, or the patterns are, uh, and so forth. And so this is where you see security teams start to apply machine learning and those kind of techniques to their data sets. So this, you know, you think about things like Excel. Well, it's great for, you know, data in a grid. And of course, you can talk to a database and it has some stats in there, but it really doesn't take you on this full journey. And very few security tools help you grow with this journey as you do it. Um, and so there are some tools that I do think are very helpful that can help people go uh, and kind of scale with them as they progress on this journey. And one of those crucial tools is an open source tool called Jupyter. How many of you have heard of Jupyter Notebooks? Okay, way more people than I expected. You guys are scaring me. Uh, so when I first started talking about Jupyter at Microsoft, it was like either, it was like basically the data scientists, people that knew about R, knew about Jupyter. Uh, or people right out of college because they're being taught machine learning in college and they're using this. And then for like all the grizzled veterans of Microsoft, they're like, what? What's this? And so if you don't know, Jupyter is an open source tool, kind of came out of the scientific computing community, built originally uh, for data science. And it has a lot of great visualization and data analytics packages in it. Um, it's, you know... It's, very, it's sort of designed and tailored to work very well with Python. A lot of network defenders know Python. If they know any scripting language, they often know Python. Uh, of course, it works with more than just Python, but that is there's many popular packages pre-written for it. And the idea is it's, a, its main thing is it, it's a notebook, um, and you can have cells where you can type code, and you can run it in an interactive way, just like you can in Python, and it has these ways to, to do these different outputs. Um, the nice thing about uh, Jupyter is it's got a very vibrant ecosystem that when, when we security people are sleeping, there's a whole vibrant community of data scientists all around the world that are working at making this thing better. Uh, they have yearly conferences. There's over 2 million notebooks on GitHub alone. Um, works on on-prem networks, it works on cloud. All the cloud uh, makers have support built in for it. And, and there's a couple important things where I think is very valuable for analysis. So one is it has this notion of you go fetch some data from somewhere, you do something on it, and then you can you know, iterate and visualize and refine it. And some of these controls can be interactive. You can zoom in, zoom out, and so forth. It has these libraries like Pandas, which make it great to go work with row set data. Um, and then once you have your notebook, you can share it with somebody else. And then they can rerun it because these notebooks are executable. So as long as they have access to the same kind of data or similar data, they can just walk through your notebook and rerun all the steps that you did and have the exact analysis result applied to the data set they're doing. And so unlike in Excel where it's like, you know, you do a bunch of stuff, you click around, maybe, you know, the, the pivot tables, boom, boom. How do you make it easy for somebody to repeat that? Um, you know, usually it takes you writing a very long email explaining what you did. And this is all of that encapsulated into a tool where you can share it. Um, these are some example notebooks. Um, this is, you know, go grab some data from one of the tools at Microsoft that stores network data and uses, this is called a cord diagram. And the idea is like, let's find out what, what IP addresses, what net blocks different machines are talking to. You may have a set of machines. You say, all these machines should really be communicating in a similar way to similar kinds of endpoints. And if there's a, anyone communicating to an anomaly, you know, maybe some command and control or whatnot, you want to understand why that is and easily see it. A core diagram makes it easy to do that. The nice thing is, you know, the reason I sort of chose this is there's no Microsoft product UI that has this core diagram. It's just one of many different kind of visualizations that are there. But because it's in an open source package and you can use Jupyter, you can go fetch your data and use, you know, stand on all of these different open source packages on their shoulders and apply those kind of visualizations easily to your data. Um, this is the same kind of data, but represented in this grid way where here's the machines and here's the net blocks. And you can see, okay, this net block, only one machine communicated to it, whereas this one over here, you had you know, six or seven different machines communicating to it. And it just different easy visual ways to do this analysis. Um, 
It has, you know, great row set support. Uh, I think this one is an example looking at uh, virus total and intersecting it, things there, uh, using, uh, you know, maps of the world to sort of plot where activity is happening from. This was analyzing some data that's uh, from Microsoft SharePoint from a, you know, as a tenant of Office 365, you, SharePoint's where you upload files, or if you're a bad guy, download files from. And this lets you look at, you know, what are the patterns and, and you know, how many, is there a burst of login from somebody or uh, maybe a significant set of file uploads to some drop site, um, clustering activity. So all of this stuff is just available in Jupyter. This is not any Microsoft technology. It's there, and the notebooks allow you to capture those steps and then allow somebody to take those and then rerun those. Um, we have notebooks that we've created kind of tailored for Windows and Linux investigation scenarios for cloud. We publish those, those notebooks. Um, this, uh, Roberto Rodriguez, otherwise known as Cyber War Dog, he's another InfoSec practitioner, uh, no affiliation with Microsoft, and he's got a series on how do you do thread hunting with Jupyter Notebooks. So there's a number of people in the community that are starting to try to popularize the notion of using these kinds of tools and technologies for doing thread hunting on your data. Um, another cool technology um, for Notebooks is there's an uh, open source technology called Paper Mill. I believe Netflix, uh, they use have a lot of data scientists at Netflix figure out what movie to recommend to you next. And they use Jupyter Notebooks and associated technologies extensively. And this paper mill, the idea there is, let's say you create a notebook which gets some data, maybe a set of alerts, and then you want to go do some enrichment or investigation or auto analysis of those you know, sequence of steps. And then you want to automate that. You say, I want that notebook to run every day or every time that event happens, paper mill is basically like, it will take your notebook and it will click run on every cell in your notebook so that you start with, it's like making your notebook into a batch file. And the cool kind of thing about this is, when you, tell, when you go to a SOC analyst and say, we can build on your, or your knowledge on Python that you maybe already know, on this um, analysis tool called Jupyter, and that becomes the way that they start to automate their own workload, like you think the, the toil in a sock is to go from what they see and manually work on to how do you automate that? And they typically have to go to some engineering team that says, okay, every time this happens, please do this thing so I have less work to do every time. And now the analysis tool they use to investigate becomes the automation tool they use to take, you know, to give them back more time. Uh, so that's another pretty nifty thing about it. And then there's this other technology called Binder. And the idea behind Binder is, you know, if you spend any time with Python, you quickly realize it's like, well, how, you know, what packages did you install to make your thing work? And do I have the same ones? And, and uh, if you just want to make it as easy for, to run the notebook as I send you a URL, you click it, you go to the browser, and you're just running the notebook. You didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to install anything. Binder is a technology that does that. And it's, uh, you can, it works with GitHub, but it doesn't require that. So here, any project where you upload uh, a notebook to GitHub, if you tell Binder about it, it gives you a shareable link. If you go visit that link, uh, it will spin up um, a live image of that where you instantly can start using that notebook with no other steps to install. So as a teaching tool, it's pretty cool. Um, so that's notebooks, uh, repeatable analysis. And then community. Of course, I started with community. Community, I think, is a super important part. Um, I have the fortune to go to many different conferences over the years. Part of the reason I go to conferences is both to get exposure to ideas like Jupyter Notebooks. I didn't hear about that at Microsoft. I went and visited another company, uh, Lockheed Martin, and I met Eric Hutchins, one of the co-authors of The Kill Chain. And he said, let me, let me show you this thing called Jupyter that we're using here. First time I had seen about it, seen it. And, you know, that was five years ago that he showed me that, you know, think about the kind of experience that people are building up, the, that there are leaders in network defense happening all over and being able to go and understand and see their practices is very important. Another reason to go to conferences is, um, you know, if you really want to know, or, you know, you want to try to know what you're doing, you 
you know, they say the secret is to write about it or try to present on it. You know, to really understand a thing well, you have to try to talk to somebody else about it. It often requires you to pop out of like what you're doing as your day job and try to synthesize and say, what is this? What's really going on here? Uh, what is this all about? So I find it very valuable. Uh, of course, there's researchers put out lot, lots of great blogs. These are a couple of researchers I follow. Sub T, Enigma, you know, pretty much every time they blog about something, I send mail at Microsoft to go look at detecting with the, the, you know, the latest technique that they have. Uh, this is Nick Carr. He works at FireEye. Um, he publishes a lot of things that they've seen in sort of their work at FireEye Mandiant. Um, Nick and I are actually in a bit of a war. Um, not a war between Microsoft and FireEye, but in an emoji war. And, uh, and the war is who can tweet with the greatest number of emojis and still be taken seriously in security? <laughs> and you can see here from this tweet, Nick is losing that war. Uh, every now and then he pops out a really good one, though, I'll say. Um, so much so that this battle's taken a life of its own, and we have had people accuse me, Patrick Wardle, of emojis are just ruining InfoSec. Uh, so I was like, well, hey, man, don't leave Nick Carr out of it. You know, he's helping ruin InfoSec as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, tools like uh, Benjamin Delphi's Mimi Cats um, as well. I mean, Mimi Cats is probably the most well known credential dumper, but when I visited Peach Neutral all those years ago, the tool crypt people showed me about Pass the Hash and their tools for doing that. Uh, and, you know, and the first time you see Pass the Hash, it is like magic. Uh, and, you know, to me, it was a good example of um, a mindset failure that I had that maybe we had at Microsoft at the time, which was went to the conference, saw the tool that was new to me, brought it back. The people in, in Windows security uh, looked at it and said, well, look, to run that tool, you have to be an administrator. You know, if you're an administrator, you know, all bets are off. So it's sort of like, you know, won't fix. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean, credential dumping things are fundamentally a hard problem to mitigate if you are an administrator. But, uh, you know, the mindset there was just deeply flawed, I would say, which is in any large network, of course, the attacker is going to get administrative rights on some set of machines. And then once you have credentials, um, you know, you're able to move laterally, pivot around, et cetera. You know, the patterns of how people use and log on to machines have these credentials persist around. It took us many years to try to, to get to understand that deeply enough. And we worked on things like Credential Guard and so forth. But I would say it's just an example of going to the community and learning about these kind of tools and seeing them, you know, help to develop these mindset changes that sometimes require time to do. And then mentoring is another thing in community I think we could all probably do a bit more uh, a better job collectively on and, and how to make it easier from individuals to mentor individuals, organizations to mentor other organizations, and so on. Um, and then, you know, I talked about, you know, Sigma and MITRE ATT&CK and so forth. So one important part of those things is that it's, they're not developed by just one entity that's putting it out there, doing all of the work, that it's built on by the community. Uh, so this is... Um, an example of a Sigma rule, uh, one of the other projects that uh, Florian has is a set of Yara rules that he runs against uh, every virus total entry. And then, you know, you can write a rule, submit it to this repository, and then it will get run on, on your behalf against every entry that submitted the virus total. And then those will get annotated in the community section. And so if you have something to contribute, if there's some malware or some thing that you know how to fingerprint with Yara, it's an easy way to contribute to this YAR repository, and then every user of VirusTotal now gets the benefit from your insight. Um, and, you know, Florian, I don't know him. I've actually never met him, but, you know, just through Twitter and GitHub, you know, I contributed rules to it just by making pull requests. And, and in doing it, you know, Florian's like, well, your YAR rule kind of sucked, you know, didn't you know about optimizing it? And I learned, uh, you know, a bunch of things about how to write much better performing YAR rules in the process. So participa participa participation is, is important and, and, and very helpful and educational as well. Um, and so this notion of being able to have the community, communi you know, contribute to community projects is, is important. Um, you can com contribute to... I sort of touched on this earlier, but you can contribute to MITRE ATT&CK. There are examples of 
these techniques in there contributed by people from Microsoft. And I talked about these attacks against SaaS, like Office 365, techniques like OAuth-based phishing that apply to not just Office 365, but other different mail providers as well. And people on my team are working in actively extending uh, and contributing back to the MITRE attack to add these techniques in there to make it easier for people to have fewer places to go to learn about these things. And then this is a project I learned about uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's happening this week, where it's uh, hack.lu. There are a number of people that have come together to add and extend uh, Sigma and try to fill in the gaps from that MITRE matrix to Sigma rules. And so they're kind of having a, hi a hackathon, both there and remotely people are contributing. And so another great way that the community is coming together to try to fill in those knowledge gaps. You know, imagine a world where the techniques in that MITRE matrix are as complete as possible for the spaces defenders need to defend, whether it's cloud, AWS, IoT, mobile, whatnot. And there are ways to go from those technique categories all the way down to rules for their seam that they can directly apply. And then a, a whole bunch of notebooks at the ready that start with the results from what uh, you might find with those rules to guided investigation scenarios. And this is why I take it back to that funny term I mentioned at the beginning, which is this notion of this GitHubification of InfoSec where Imagine people that track threat actors, instead of just writing about it, map them in terms of the MITRE matrix. Those, that matrix has a technique database full of detailed description of how all those techniques work. Each of those techniques has a set of detections that are written uh, in languages like Sigma that the community is contributing to. Now you have a way to go from... Um, a TTP down to a concrete expression of that, how to hunt for it in the products and tools that defenders are using. Um, and then when you get results, you have ways to do analysis with them that in ways that are increasingly repeatable and more approachable by a greater audience. And wouldn't it be great to have a world where these things are all designed to work together? These are not independent tools, but they are designed to be tailored in a sort of a stacked and additive way. And wherever you can contribute, whether it's up here or over here, you know, the stack of these things is getting more fleshed out, uh, hangs together. It's a fewer set of things that defenders need to learn in order to be very effective. Um, and so, you know, with that, it's these areas that I think uh, by, you know, harnessing the the enthusiasm, the knowledge, the passion of the community, we can make a big difference. And you kind of go back to this quote, and you can see, if you, do want to, if you do want to go far by having people work together on this, you see you will be able to go far across the entire community. So with that, thank you all for listening to me today. I'm very excited to be here.